Hi guys, welcome back to the Touch MBA podcast. I'm your host, Darren. This week, I brought on one of my old friends, Paul Bodine, who is one of the world's most experienced admissions consultants. He's been in the industry for over 25 years. Paul and his team have over 140 years of collective admissions consulting experience with more than 2,000 admitted clients. He wrote the best-selling Great Applications for Business School, uh, which I profiled in episode number 47 on this show. At Poets and Quants, he is also ranked as a top 10 consultant with the most positive client reviews over time. In fact, he made Poets and Quants Admissions Coach Hall of Fame for his five consecutive years on the best consultant list. All this to say that Paul has a lot of experience and uh, a lot of happy clients. In fact, 60% of Admitify's MBA clients gained admission or an interview invitation at Stanford, Wharton, and Harvard, which is you know higher than the average, much higher than the average. And in this episode, we talk about how Paul helps clients with seemingly common profiles discover the most uncommon parts of their profile. In other words, helps them discover their most game-changing assets and differentiators. So I really think you'll get a lot out of this conversation. And because Paul is, is an old friend and I truly believe in his services, you can also get a discount at Admitify, Paul's company, by mentioning Touch MBA. So definitely check out the show notes to this episode available at touchmba.com slash admitify. A-D-M-I-T-I-F-Y to get those discounts from Touch MBA. And one last reminder that you can get free school selection help at touchmba.com. We have a lot of uh, free resources for you over there to help you make the best MBA investment. That's what we're trying to do here at Touch MBA. Let's get straight to my talk with Paul. Here we go. My next guest, Paul Bodine, is one of the world's most experienced admissions consultants. He has over 25 years of experience. He's a graduate of University of Chicago and Johns Hopkins University. Paul is the author of six books on admissions, including the best-selling Great Applications for Business School, which is one of my personal favorites, which we did a podcast on a few years ago, and Perfect Phrases for Business School Acceptance. Paul was recognized in the Poets and Quants Admissions Coach Hall of Fame in 2021 for his five consecutive years on the best consultant list. And uh, he is also ranked as a top 10 consultant with the most positive client reviews over time. Paul has been quoted in such publications such as the Wall Street Journal, the Financial Times, Bloomberg Business Week, Money Magazine, US News and World Report, Poets and Quants, of course. And uh, Paul's Admitify team, Admitify is the name of his admissions consulting business, has over 140 years of collective admissions consulting experience with more than 2,000 admitted clients. Paul, welcome back to the Touch MBA podcast. Darren, thank you for having me back. I appreciate it. And I love the intro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not Paul... as old as the <laughs> Paul was actually one of the first people I reached out to after I was an admissions director at Singapore Management University. I reached out to Paul because I absolutely loved his book. And, you know, I wanted to get in touch with one of the leaders in the admissions consulting space. So I've known Paul for a long time. Um, so it's always fun to, to have these conversations. Yeah, we go way <laughs> back. So it's always fun to have these conversations. But Paul, I'm going to get straight to the point because, you know, I love your Admitify site. And one of my favorite parts of your site is the case study section, which we will link to in the show notes. And you have all these different okay. cases of applicants who on first sight might not have seemed so remarkable, but after your work or your team's work with those clients, you were able to unearth, you know, what made each of these uh, clients remarkable. And I want to steal a quote you actually, or something you wrote in one of these case studies, you wrote, applicants with seemingly par for the course profiles can have game changing assets if you dig deep enough. And I just love that phrase 
And I want to explore this idea of digging with you and how all our listeners can dig deep enough to find those game-changing assets. So my first question to you, Paul, is like, why is this digging process important? No, it's a great, I love unearth, unearthing, digging. It's all good. <laughs> yeah, we're digging here. <laughs> <laughs> That's the metaphor. Yeah, no, I, it's so important because some people don't realize or or they think they have some idea of what the ideal applicant is and, you know, some polished, super polished type A person and they think they have to match that. And so they don't, they try to cover up or or disguise or ignore things that really matter to them because they think that somehow doesn't fit this ideal that they have. Um, you know, this kind of generic platonic ideal of the applicant. You know, we all have sort of an idea. You know, what do the schools want? You know, and so that's that's one reason why, why you need to dig is because people bring the wrong attitude to the process. They think I need to be like someone else. I think sometimes there's a certain modesty also some people, or, or maybe they just don't know what could be interesting. Yeah, that's, it's probably more likely that they don't know what could be interesting. And the schools are not like Sanford, my favorite school. <laughs> they, they, they come right out and say that they define background as your work and life experiences, education, skills, interests, culture, socioeconomic status, sexual orientation, gender identity, race, ethnicity, where you grew up, and other factors. I mean, so what isn't included in that? I mean, so their definition of background and identity is extremely broad. And that's where I think people think, oh, I need to be a underrepresented minority or, or something like that, or or they, they think it's all about an ethnicity or something. And, and really, Stanford and all the other schools are saying, no, it can be so many different things. And so you just need to get people thinking that there are aspects of their background that could really be different. Um, so I have a process for, for unearthing that. And uh, it basically, I mean, it all starts with the resume. You look for anything that is off the beaten track in terms of what what we see a lot of. I mean, and every everyone knows what that is. I mean, a lot of applicants from the U.S. and from India and from China, you know, how do they differentiate? So, or they're all from finance and private equity. You know, I mean, um, how do you? So, so you look, try to look beneath that. You try to look for aspects within their their very common profile that may be uncommon and I'm happy to talk about that but that's so it starts with the resume even looking at things like hobbies you know anything that stands out like and from India who who likes cricket you know you look beyond that because everyone likes cricket right so you look for the things that are a little bit um off the beaten path and and that starts with the resume but then also we have a questionnaire and uh, that we give these, this is when you sign up to work with Admitify, we give you a questionnaire to fill out. And that questionnaire asks questions like, what are your defining moments or key experiences? Talk about significant obstacles or challenges you have overcome. What are you most passionate about? What's your bliss? What are your highs? What sets you apart from your peers? What's the toughest decision you ever made? What do you most regret? I mean, it's it asks a lot of mundane factual questions, but it also asks those questions. And the purpose of those questions is really tell us something that someone may not know at first glance. So, so that's 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 how the discovery process starts. And you know, I, I would say that usually I think people need to give themselves more credit. Applicants need to give themselves more credit than than they do. We are all more interesting than we may think we are. And I mean, when you define background or identity as broadly as the schools do, I would say 90, 95% of applicants have something that without too much digging could be a differentiator. And, you know, it's true that there are some applicants who don't, uh, who have lived their entire lives trying to fit some kind of path and uh, they haven't really taken risks or tried to do things that are unusual. And those clients, frankly, you have to work harder to get their stories out, but usually there's something there. So 
I love that. And I want to talk about maybe the fear some of our listeners have to expose these things in a business school graduate level program that they're applying to, yeah. right? I mean, they're <laughs> supposed to be all-stars. They're supposed to be masters of the universe. I mean, right. right? And then to talk about an obstacle or a defining moment or a tough decision or a regret even, that seems quite exposing or vulnerable perhaps? Yeah, no, I, you have to get over that that uh, hurdle. I mean, part of our process is to build the trust with the client that they're willing to share those personal things. And of course, making clear to the client that this is not just a uh, GMAT score and, and your resume anymore. That, that, that at, certainly at the top schools, you need something else. You need to be bringing something else about yourself. You need, you know, the, the self-awareness is the hot hot term and obviously diversity and identity are, are important terms. So you need to be bringing something more than just your, your numbers and your resume. And so they have to get over that. And I think over time, I've been seeing clients coming to me and they already know that they have to bring something, you know, that has, that has to get self-revealing at some point. Uh, I'd see the clients who are trying to resist that are becoming increasingly a small number over, mm. over the years. They, That's great. Everyone's starting to get it. Yeah. Yeah. And so you go through, you start with the resume, you you also lead with your questionnaire and you try to get your clients to open up to you yes. or and to find those gems. What if they have 10 of them? Like how how do you decide what is really the game changing asset, right? What is really remarkable? Do you have a sort of thought process in your mind or or a rubric or is it just something that strikes you? That's a great question. I, <laughs> if they have 10, if they have 10, then, then the challenge is how many of those 10 relate to each other? Is or Do they connect to each other in some way? You, you know, in other words, uh, that, that would be one, one way that I would approach it. Another way I would approach it would be to try to connect those differentiators to challenge challenges in their life, to adversity, to uh, change over time, their you know their journey. How how have they changed over time? And so, if you can find hmm. differentiate that connect to what they've been through in life, then you're starting to not only identify differentiators, but you're starting to find stories. You're starting to connect the differentiator uh, differentiators to stories. And of course, what in my idea, what you really want is to show that the applicant has changed over time. To me, that's if you can show that something that the applicant has has evolved from something to something else, then you're you've got you found something. But I mean, so typically I would so in addition to the questionnaire, we'll do multiple phone calls, uh, discovery sessions, you know, sessions we call them, and uh, really deep diving on on anything and everything that could be a differentiator. It could be professional, it could be a hobby, it could be a life challenge. And so some people say, well, what if I don't have a woe is me story? Well, you know, it doesn't have to be something that happened to you. It could be something that you you sought out yourself. You know, some challenge you put yourself through. Your life was was actually has not been a difficult life, but you have sought out challenge, you know. Then that can become an interesting story. So so I I typically for for like a school like Stanford or Harvard that that uh, and I love them for this, you know, they give the applicant a lot of space. You look for extended anecdotes that of of change, of evolution, uh, where they're not only it's an experience that you're they're actually allowing the reader to see them change or to see them behave. It's a similar to the behavioral questions that Stanford asks in their interview. A lot of schools ask behavioral questions. Tell me about a time when. So you're looking for those kind of extended moments in this person's life when it was tough or they changed or they had to make some decision it could be ethical decision it could be just a very difficult uh, life life uh, situation and those can often you find you can really build great uh, stories around those difficult moments so absolutely i mean and when you say kind of you know you try to find you try to connect these points of differentiation you try to integrate them Essentially, what I'm what I'm hearing from that is 
these stories and these differentiators need to be centered around a few key themes or one theme, or how would you describe it when you, you know, when you're trying to integrate it for the reader, right? I mean, for the applicant and the reader. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. When you're trying to help them both. Right. That's another great question. I think uh, people get hung up on the theme, you know, like what matters most that Stanford has, they get hung up. How can I start writing my essay unless I know what my theme is? And I tell them, you know, why don't you start with your best stories? You know, why don't you start with, and we'll figure out the theme, you know, and mm, in other words, interesting. you know, the what, hmm. the what matters most can be the piece you do last, you know, hmm. and yes. I think what can matter most is what are the, the stories you tell, and hopefully there's some connection between them, or, or even if it's not, there's some learnings for each of them that make the person who they are now. Um, so, I mean, I think it's perfectly fine to have uh, three themes, if you will, or, or three macro differentiators. That's totally fine. If a school asks you what matters most to you, you have to kind of distill it down at some point to something, you know, I, I don't start from what matters most. I, I, I just try to find the, the stories that seem like they're the most meaningful or that strike me as, uh, and, and the applicant as being important to them or that changed mm. them. So we try I love to... that approach. I love that actually, because it's kind of, um, yeah, if a story matters so much to you, I mean, there's, why is that? It's because it, it, it shows your values or it shows what's important to you. Right. And you don't have to lecture so much about that. If the story is good enough in a way, that's, that's kind of what yeah. I'm hearing from you. Yeah, I think that's right. And, and, you know, I mean, if someone asks, a hundred people, what matters most to them, uh, you're going to hear a lot of the same words probably, but the stories that they would use to tell the, what matters most to them would be vastly different. Like, I mean, well, we're all going to say our family matters most to us. So, you know, how much does it really matter what matters most statement is? Mm. I think it, it, to me, what matters most is what, how did you get there? You know, what are the stories you've told that got you there? And uh, so that's, that's part of the process. Love it. I think you you mentioned you might have some 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 examples or cases to share with us in terms of how to go about doing this. Yes, yes, I have. I, I wanted to start with your your premise of the the client or the applicant who is not obviously standing out from the pack, and so I found a couple applicants who who are at least at first glance, were were not terribly differentiated people. Uh, They were in finance, for example, or they were from middle class, uh, non, you know, minority backgrounds, that kind of thing. And we, I'll I'll take one example. This person was basically a middle class uh, white American male uh, who was trying to get into finance. And it turned out, that he came from a small town. So that was kind of interesting. Okay, he's not maybe from a a bigger urban environment. It turned out that his father was a, I'll say, you know, small businessman. I mean, nothing, nothing major, but there was some entrepreneurship there and which he, this this inspired the client, his his father's successful small town entrepreneurship. Um, It also turned out that he happened to have an interesting hobby that I'd never heard of before, and it's called snowboarding. They call it glading. Apparently, it's snowboarding off trail, snowboarding through a through a through the forest, if you will. And um, I thought, okay, that's interesting. I wonder if that. Where do we go with that? And uh, it turned out that we found a way to to connect the story about him loving uh, glading. It, to his own kind of efforts to bootstrap himself into a career. He had gone to a no-name school that was not a feeder school to finance. You know, so how do you break into investment banking if you don't have that, that background? Well, he kind of bootstrapped himself and he he classic kind of actions like, I'll clean your office if, if you just will give me a chance to learn or, or you know, I'll, I'll take a, I'll, you don't have to pay me kind of, he, he was willing to do those kinds of things. So he basically has this wonderful bootstrapping story that kind of, and, and his hobby is a bit of a metaphor for that bootstrapping story. So he got into Chicago booth, which was happy ending. So, I mean, that that's one, one typical story. Another one, 
similar background in terms of demographics, not really unusual. Uh, someone who's interested in finance, middle class, uh, middle America, white male. It turned out this guy had one one interesting thing going for him. I thought everything about him seemed to uh, involve the city he grew up in, which was St. Louis. His his family had been there, had grown up there for you know centuries, and everything he'd done was was based on on the city of St. Louis. And it turned out that now that he was back in St. Louis. Uh, in his career, he was kind of helping St. Louis turn around, you know, so that his differentiation almost became the fact that he wasn't differentiated, that he was he was such a local guy. And so we use that to help to that was his story it became sort of helping uh, his town succeed. And um, I believe he got into uh, Warden. So uh, that's another, another kind of story. So it's those kinds of things you're looking for. Uh, something a little bit off the off the obvious that but but is actually important to that to that applicant. I love that. I mean, I, I love hearing how you how you think how you're thinking through each of these applicants. I mean, do you have any more of those? I do. <laughs> I'm just actually, really I, enjoying. Huh? Yeah, I, I, I'm sorry to to pick out uh, white middle class males, but I those <laughs> that, that's one of the applicant pools that is you know most challenged. I mean, let's be honest. Another one uh, similar. He was a uh, Canadian white middle class male. Basically, was I think a consultant. So on the surface, nothing terribly. He had gone to an O-name undergraduate program. Uh, nothing terribly different about him, unless you you dig deep and then you realize, oh, he's he's Latter Day Saints. He's a a, a Mormon. Okay, that's interesting. So he had to spend two years uh, overseas, and he spent two years in Korea, and he became fluent. I mean, like native fluent in Korean, which is quite impressive. So now you've got something. <laughs> and then it turned out that he had married someone from that country and um, they had had a, a daughter and the daughter was was disabled. I mean, a major, you know, life life dependent kind of disabled. And so now you've got now you've got some real powerful material there. So and that took some digging to to find to find that. But, you know, he got into Wharton because we found the stuff that really is differentiated him and it also happened to be what really mattered to him and what he was you know really proud of so i mean i will say that the percentage of my applicants who have some kind of wow factor differentiator is i'd say it's well under 20 percent and the majority are you have to dig a little bit to find the differentiator so the ones that are are just you know one way uh, unusual are are not really the common ones. So, yeah. I mean, so let's take the the glading example. The yeah. first the first example you used, right? Yes. I'm just curious, in terms of presenting that story, it's usually done through the essays for you. Yes. Yes, and. Do you have any tips there in terms of how to present these stories? You lead with the story and sort of end with the theme or like, is it different each time? I'm just curious how you think about, oh. you know, that essay organization process and so that it can really impact the readers and grab their attention, right? Because we all know that's that's very important as well. Yeah, that's, that's a great question as well. Um, uh, that's another sort of tip is the if you're someone whose story is frankly not that unusual the way you tell your story can can be the differentiator i mean if you tell it with a lot of personality and let's say humor and a lot of sort of self-revelation self-exposure even if your story is not all that unusual you're you're helping yourself you're connecting with the reader you're showing yourself as a sympathetic person, um, you're winning the reader's empathy because you're telling the story in the right way. So, and what does that mean in the right way? Well, it, it means not really holding back. It's, it's, you're, you're letting the reader into the story. You're, you're describing your own actions. You're expressing your own self doubts. You're, you're admitting to do something well, or you didn't understand something, you know, it's a little bit, winning the reader's interest by sharing of who you are, sharing sharing the sort of the difficult processes with the reader. And also in my approach is you just try to 
use as much detail as possible. In other words, if you grew up in a small town, mm. try to put the reader there because mm. yes. a lot of people grew up in a small town. I mean, so so using detail, vivid detail to differentiate yourself from the other people who have a similar background. So, you know, I would just say vivid detail, being sort of honest and not feeling like a, a business school essay has to be written in a dry kind of official way. Obviously, the opposite of that. You know, you want it to be very personal and conversational, and even a little bit confessional, if you will. Then you're gonna you're gonna have the reader's interest. You know, and then if you could start it in an interesting way, sure, that's great. It doesn't have to be. You can start it chronologically. You can. St- I, I usually don't start it out with like a theme statement. I usually save that last because I think. Uh, that's something they teach you in high school English. I mean, you've got to state your theme, you know, right. in the first sentence. And so let's not, you know, let's not go there. So that's, those are just some of the ways, just you got to be personal, though, I think. And I think the challenge is that some of the schools are not really giving you the, the opportunity to tell an extended story or to tell a personal story because they're not asking for that. Some of the schools, many, most of the schools these days don't do that. So a lot of, my advice here would be for people aiming for schools like University of Chicago or Stanford or Harvard that still ask for kind of extended um, essays. So, yeah. So let me let me just uh, dig dig a little deeper on that answer. So, let's say the schools aren't giving you a lot of real estate to really tell tell your stories right in an extended way. Like I loved your phrase, extended anecdotes. Yeah. What would you advise your clients in terms of okay? I, I have all this material, but I have such limited space, but I really want to tell this story. How do you combine sort of the essays and the interview? Because you need to put the enough in the essays so you get the MBA admissions directors interested in you enough so they want to interview you. And then hopefully you have this chance, more airspace to like expound upon that. I don't know. That's 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 one one approach yeah. I could see, but I'm wondering how you think about it. Well, you look for ways to, I mean, even the essays, even the schools that don't ask for a lot of essays, they give you, I mean, tip, the typical, this will be like Kellogg and Wharton, you know, they'll give you like a a goals, why Wharton kind of essay. And then the second one is a little bit kind of why you, you know, it's a little yes. bit kind of get at what, what, what do you bring? So that's where the personal stuff goes. And you just you learn to telegraph it. You, you have to sometimes do it in a very concise way. And so it can still be done or, you know, you use optional essays or you lean a little bit more on the resume. You know, if you look at your entire application holistically and you say, okay, I have only X amount of slots in which to share my stories, you can get a little bit strategic or creative about which piece goes where, you know? And so sometimes there's a way to, to fit the stuff, everything in, in a more telegraphed way. But it's there's no doubt that it's tougher, and I, you know, frankly, I think that at some schools, the fact that they don't give you that much space means that they are evaluating you more in terms of the surface level, you know, the the resume and the test scores and things like that, which it shouldn't be that way, you know. So I mean, yeah, hopefully you get the interview, and some schools, you know, you can proactively get the interview, like talk or something, you know, everyone can get interviewed if they they approach it the right way. So, and maybe that's where you share your, your stories, but it's no doubt it's tougher. Yeah. yeah. I mean, any, any last sort of thoughts on this digging process, um, <laughs> you know, identifying these game changing assets for our listeners. This has been great. I'm wondering, yeah, if there's yeah, I, any last I, tips. I would just say, you know, it's, Usually, uh, I, I mean, I think if someone asked me or asked you, you know, what do you think is most dif- uh, differentiating about yourself? You know, you may you, maybe you come up with the wrong answer. You know, I think you need someone else to help you in that process, which is where consultants or friends or family come in. You know, what is it about me that maybe I don't understand is really a little bit interesting? And I would just say, talk to other people and get some feedback from other people about, about maybe what's a hidden a hidden gem that you, that's, that someone has. I mean don't don't think it has it has to be a hobby. It could be some class you took in school that you really loved like you majored in psychology. Well, why did you major in psychology, you know? Or let's say you're in a you're in private equity but 
it's a specific niche within private equity that's maybe a little bit different, you know? It's so you need to get you need to really turn the stones over and really get granular about the aspects of your profile. And it could be there could be some little thing. And so so don't um don't make too many assumptions about what a differentiator uh, needs to be, what a good differentiator needs to be. I went through a few resumes before this call and I just tried to, you know, obviously 90% of it is something that is resembles what you've seen before, right? So you look for the things that jump out. I, you know, I've never seen that before. Like, like uh, someone was, their career was in private credit. Okay. That's a very niche environment within finance. Okay. Someone else was into ESG debt. Okay. That's, this is this this is all like pretty standard finance resumes, but they're they're involved in some unusual areas. Or like, you know, everyone talks about health tech, but how about gov tech or ag tech or mm. femtech? I mean, or you know, you can you just have to be kind of open to looking for the things that are a little bit uh, different. No, absolutely. And I wish those of you listening to the show could see how expressive and excited Paul is like uh, to do this. <laughs> and um, yeah, I, I mean, I encourage I encourage you all to do check out the case studies on Admitify because you will be able to see how Paul and his team have have dug deeper. And, and a lot of those examples from what I remember are work bullets that would be on your resume. You know, maybe you say something like help team grow their customer base, right? But then what you do is really dive into what does what exactly does that mean? And maybe there's a really interesting story or accomplishment or obstacle overcome in that bullet, right? That the candidate just isn't talking right. about. So I think a lot of the case studies are, are like that and are very instructive. Paul, I want to just on a personal note, thank you so much for, for sharing these nuggets of wisdom. I'm sure it's going to help a lot of our listeners, but I'm just curious on a personal note, like who are some of the writers you, you look up to, or maybe people that help inspire you as you go about, you know, helping MBA applicants and other applicants to graduate schools, you know, identify and tell their best stories. I love that question. Thanks, Darren. <laughs> no, I would say uh, Michael Lewis is a, is a guy I've been reading a lot of. Good one. Uh, and- yeah. You know, he's Absolutely. a business writer. He's a business writer, but he's also a, a really wonderful writer, very talented writer. And he's able to take very complicated, uh, mundane, seemingly mundane topics like, you know, business or, or whatever. And he's able to find the the moral dilemma, if you will, or the human interest element mm-hmm. of that. the people he writes about, you know. So it's not, no, it's no longer just a business challenge or a business story but there's like a human interest element to it you know and it becomes interesting on a personal level and i think that same kind of approach can help a lot of applicants with um, you know businesses can be interesting business can be a and should be a personal commitment right it should be personal and so i think that same kind of mindset could help uh, applicants Absolutely. And I'll link to uh, Michael Lewis's podcast against the rules. I think I think it's a really great podcast series and people can kind of kind of see and discover how he does exactly what you said in in audio form, which might not be as taxing as as reading one of his longer books, even though you should still do that as well or his articles. So, Paul, how can our listeners find you if they would like to learn more about your services, potentially how you could help them? Absolutely. Um, just um, admitify.com is the company's website, and that's where I, I am. So if you want to reach out to me directly, it's paul at admitify.com or just visit the website yes. and, and you know register at our site, and I'll be available and happy to speak with anyone who wants to speak with me. That's great. Thank you so much, Paul, for coming back on the show. It's been fun. Thank you, Tim. <laughs> Appreciate it. Thanks for listening to the Touch MBA podcast. Remember, you can get free school selection help and a profile review at touchmba.com. You can also follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter. Just search for Touch MBA.